Andrew, so today we're going to talk about the the impact of stories. And I suppose, you know, we we haven't met each other previously. And one of the no. things that people often do when they meet somebody for the first time, it's like they'll ask questions like, where do you come from? What do you do? And and I suppose the the intention behind those kinds of questions is like, tell me your story, because I suppose we have this kind of intrinsic interest in finding out what someone's story is so let's start with that like what is your story what you know what um what is it that you do in Australia you know what what inspires you what is your purpose I know you've written books about the subject of creativity what inspired you to do that so tell me your story in a few words though not in a few words well I don't know how far back we go I I met my wife in high school (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, she's our, she's the partner, she's the intellectual brains behind us with a PhD working at Sydney University Business School in the Department of Innovation and Strategy. Um, I'm, I won't say I'm the creative one because she's also very creative, but I, I like to take some of her research <clears throat> and see if we can make it applicable to the average person and engaging to the average person. I think um, my, my background has been, both our backgrounds are in education and we've been passionate about education for years. And that really is about bringing a message to um, the average person. So sometimes a lot of this academic research can be too high and dry and and not applicable. Um, At the other extreme, you might get childish team building games or just fun stuff. And we, 25 years ago, we started looking at the conference industry and I suppose our story is we, you know, we, we, we just saw a real need that we saw that the conference industry in the morning was very technical, a lot of keynote talks, not very interactive. And then often they'd go out and play childish team building games in the afternoon and then maybe at night they'd all get drunk and, uh, and have a celebratory dinner. And we thought, well, this is, you know, we saw conferences coming to Bali and very exotic places in Asia. And some companies were spending a million dollars in a conference and we thought, what are they really going to remember at the end of the conference? They might have an inspirational keynote talk or they might have a, a dry academic talk, but what are they actually going to remember and how are they going to remember it? And so it was really, we started looking at it and thinking, well, what about if we made the morning more interesting and more interactive? What about if we made the, the typical afternoon of activities more outcomes and learner focused? And from there, we, we really came up with a whole new type of programs. I mean, We didn't have a lot of interaction with corporate back then, but our first client was Accenture. Our second client was National Australia Bank and our third client was the Four Seasons Hotel. So we thought, well, we must be doing something something right as we came into that corporate background. Our background before then was in education and a lot of NGO work. And so how did that lead to creativity? Well, some of our clients, and in this case, it was Goldman Sachs, said, look, we love your creative approach to programs. Could you please teach us about creative thinking. So that was about 15 years ago. Uh, We were asked to start designing programs, not only to be creative, but to actually talk about creative thinking and get some of these uh, more traditional companies, particularly uh, conservative country companies like banks, to actually um, start to look at creative thinking and see it as a way to benefit them rather than just some uh, what, what they their perception of creative thinking was staring at clouds and singing sweet songs um, or, or playing guitar. So we were wanting to say that, you know, creative thinking is actually a process that can be used to solve difficult problems. And we really need to get people looking beyond what they, they see as immediately in front of them. And the process takes place in a context. You know, uh, a lot of people, it seems to me that they isolate the thinking and for me it's like well thinking takes place in a context and and as you say it's a process we can't have a process without the context in which the process takes place so a process in a bank will be very different to a process in education for example and Mm. um and i think at the core of it it's what's the purpose who what's the identity you know and we can talk about the identity of an individual and the identity of an organization. So a bank, for example, has a very different identity compared with, um, you know, let's say education again, a school. A school identifies its own purpose and its mission, its raison d'etre to be very different to the the purpose that a bank exists for. So Mm. I suppose the story has to be built around what is the purpose of purpose of this identity and this existence? 
And when they do a workshop with you, when they when they do this training with you, there needs to be something which has transformed in terms of who they believe they are, because if they if there's no shift, then the behavior is very likely to remain the same. What's your experience of that? Gosh, I've got about 10 things to answer for that one. Maybe I'll work backwards if there's no, because that's the most, that's the one in my in the top of my mind. But if there's no shift, there's no behavior change. So, you know, from an educational background, if you're just inspiring or motivating people, which is the, and I'm quite critical of my industry, so forgive me, I'm also critical of myself, but the inspirational, motivational speaker that rags to riches, climb Mount Everest, uh, whatever, if there's no shift in learning, then, then, then all they get to do is have bragging rights to say, I went and heard so and so. I had to speak at a conference that the previous speaker the year before me was Steve Wozniak. And then up came Andrew Grant, author of Who Killed Creativity? Who's he? I'm a nobody. Uh, it's very hard to follow these famous people, but I have to ask myself, what am I offering that they're not offering? I'm sure they've got great inspirational stories, but sometimes these inspirational stories can actually have a negative effect at conferences because people go away saying, well, I, I, I don't have that drive. I can't climb Everest. I can't get out of bed every morning and be as disciplined as this person. I don't have the entrepreneurial risk-taking skills of Steve Wozniak. Noting for every Steve Wozniak, there's probably 100 that never made it, and that's called survivorship bias. So, so I looked at, we looked at this learning environment, and as I said, it started in the conference industry and started to realize, what, as you said, what's the behavior shift? And they go and play team building in the afternoon, which would be a bit of fun, let off steam. But, but again, there was no learning. There was no facilitator to actually design a, a particular experiential learning, learning experience, and then take the people through that to try and get an outcome of maybe communicating better or in today's world, learning to work in virtual teams or in our area, uh, you know, we, we wrote the book called Who Killed Creativity and How to Get It Back. And then we designed a whole uh, interactive game board. And now we've got an online game board where people can use it as a diagnostic tool to discover what, what blocks their creativity. I'll get to that part of the, how we ended up writing a book on that particular topic in a minute. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm just trying to remember your first questions in that, in that very, what, what were some of those opening questions? Because well, the suppose, last one was about behaviour. Yeah, I suppose it's to do with, for me, identity and behaviour are integral. Oh, the different yeah. contexts. Yes. Right. Look, I, I think it's ironic. I mean, you mentioned the word banking process and creativity. They, they seem to be a paradox because the last thing banks want is creativity. I mean, they tried that during the GFC and it didn't work too well with fiddling the books and being creative that way. And yet when people think about creativity, we tend to have a stereotype that it's not about processes. It's actually about freeing your mind and, and going outside the box and thinking of boundaries. But if you want to bring creativity into the corporate world, the paradox is you actually have to give them a process. But you're right, if it's school and kindergarten, then, then it is about letting kids play and free play. And I know you and me have, have very well um, researched on the, on the concept of play and the power of play, uh, particularly amongst children. But you start talking about adults playing and they get a bit freaked out or, or downtime. So if we want to pitch the story or the organisational narrative of creative thinking to adults, we need to say, well, we need to sort of blend that paradox of creativity and processes together and see if they can actually work as a creative process. Um, and therefore, for, for an adult to look at creativity, they do have to go through some sort of process. Um, and that, that's where if we've heard the word design thinking or the ability to actually you know, go, go through a series of stages to help them look at creative thinking, which is the diverse, you know, going up and up and up, looking at diverse thinking and then coming down, looking at the more critical thinking. So you're absolutely right. We need to frame the, the narrative of creative thinking in the corporate world inside a process or inside a model that helps them come to a learning outcome. And that is to solve problems faster better, uh, more achievable, and outside where their current competitors are thinking. Whereas if we go down to school children, it is about giving them the chance to play, the freedom to play, uh, the ability to, to explore and, and lose all those boundaries. Um, you know, we, we've, you watch kids now being ferried from one activity to another. After they finish school, they get taken off to maths lessons and then violin lessons and then maybe go to the gym. They have absolutely no downtime whatsoever. Any downtime is spent on their screen. Uh, our kids are losing that ability to play and be creative. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the narrative uh, or story behind creativity for children 
and creativity for corporate adults are two very, very different stories. And also you talk about children. I, um, I remember teaching a 16 year old um, in London and my approach, I, because I'm so passionate about creativity is I was always asking them to be creative. And I remember saying to this 16 year old Chris, you know, I want you to think for yourself. And his response to that, he wanted me to guide him more. And he said, but miss, I'm only 16. I don't know how to think for myself. I want you to, to tell me that what I've got to do. And it's like, and so there was this, I suppose that is um, the importance of age as well. You know, it's like, we can't, uh, we can't expect a 16 year old to think as maturely as a 26 year old, you know? Uh, well, that's an interesting point. Um, we made a video called Hands Up. It's on our YouTube channel playlist. Uh, years ago when I was young and, and, and not gray and not wrinkled, where we actually went into my daughter's school. It was an international school in, in Asia. And what we did was we asked all the children from kindergarten all the way through to year 12. We went to every single class because it was only one or two classes per year, which was a great microcosm. Who thinks they're creative? And it was one of the most fun days I've ever had because we started in kindergarten and all the kids in kindergarten are putting their hands up, busting, saying, I'm creative, I'm creative. And they just, you watch the video and the enthusiasm of the kindergarten kids is phenomenal. And exactly a graph like that. I mean, it, you couldn't draw a better graph. By the time we got to year 12 and we asked who thinks that creative, one kid sort of sheepishly put his hand up. Um, so then we went into the playground and, and again, we, we observed, as you, it's not, not, not that you need to be observant, to watch the younger kids just playing and exploring and trying different ideas and the older kids just sitting talking. So we interviewed the younger kids and the older kids in the playground and asked them, particularly the older kids, what happened? And I remember one girl, she said, I don't know, we just stopped playing. And then finally we got permission and this, you know, I don't know if this day and age we could do this. We got permission to interview the teachers. Now I had a good relationship with the teachers. So it was kind of a, a fun interview, but I basically said to the teachers, look, we've just gone right through the, right through your year K to 12 asking who thinks they're creative. Um, started off busting by year 12, nobody. What are you, what's your response to that? And um, Zoe's favourite teacher uh, basically said, look, the, he was a maths teacher, he said, the problem is school rewards correctness. And particularly as you get older, it doesn't reward creativity. Now, he's a maths teacher, but then he went on to say, but actually, even in maths, we need to learn to be creative. Now, that's why we wrote the book, Who Killed Creativity? Because, because we discovered there were a million books out there on how to be creative, but we felt that no one was addressing this particular issue that, that, that uh, I think we've, the research is that 98% um, of five-year-olds score high in, in convergent creative thinking, and only 2% of adults score high in that same test. Uh, if you do the Torrance testing, the CQ testing, you'll see again that children score much higher in the Torrance testing of CQ than adults. And so we didn't want to write another book or design another seminar on how to be creative. There's too much competition. We thought it would be worth exploring the issue of what blocks the creativity, what, what, what does happen in this journey from uh, childhood to adulthood. And then ironically, it's at adulthood, as you said yourself, is when we need to be creative. And yet school conditioned it out of us. And then we went on to university again when we were rewarded for being correct. And then most of the KPIs in a corporate environment are rewarding correctness. So we don't want to take the risk in a corporate environment to be creative. Um, and yet we know the research from the IBM CEO survey and the World Economic Forum are saying that CEOs believe that creative thinking is the number one attribute people need to upskill themselves. So we've got this paradox. We were creative as children. We're no longer creative as adults, according to the research, uh, and yet, and yet, it's demanded of us in the corporate world. And yet, the corporate world is not setting the environment to be creative. It's not measuring our creativity. It's measuring our correctness. So, I hope your listeners can can sit with that paradox because that's quite a big one that they really need to start to think about. How do we resolve that paradox when the corporate world and the workplace is not encouraging it? Well, there's um. There's a mismatch between what people say is important and what 
is important in reality in terms of getting a job because a lot of these CEOs may say that creativity is the number one skill because they have made it to that position. I don't think you can get to be a CEO without being creative in some way, you know? Mm. Um, so a leader, a leader needs to be creative. It's part of, um, you know, the risk taking and the experimenting and, and being influential. It's all part of creativity. But when somebody is um, you know, taking a junior level job, they're expected to conform rather than to mm. be creative because being creative is too risky and they have to fit in rather than belong. And you know, so the starting point, the entry point of getting into an organization is usually, even though they may say, we want you to be creative. Well, if it's Google or if it's, if it's Facebook, if it's Apple, of course, it's very different. But mm. when, when we're talking about organizations that are more traditional, that have a traditional role rather than, rather than a creative role, um, then conformity seems to be rewarded more than creativity in practical terms. Well, that's right. I mean, I, there's a, a great story we have in the book where we talk about a general manager uh, paid a lot of money for us to come and run creative thinking sessions, design thinking sessions for his uh, team. And this is why we ended up, as I said, focusing the book and the seminar on the Who Kill Creativity aspect before they do the design thinking. Because we'd been teaching design thinking for 20 years, but we realized people were coming saying, well, you know, again, in banking, well, this is not my responsibility. Uh, I'm not creative. I've got too much pressure. There's too much fear. My boss is a control freak so we started collecting all these excuses and then we worked with a neuroscientist to ask well what what's going on up here when someone's under fear what's happening to their brain and he talked about the fact it goes from the front of the brain which is the more um uh, modern brain back to the primitive brain which is the fight flight or freeze when someone's under fear so there's no way you can be creative if you're living in your primitive brain in a fight flight or freeze um, aspect and yet that fight fight or flee, freeze was designed to help us you know get out of an emergency and yet most companies put us in that in that sort of emergency situation uh 24 7 we're, we're constantly living under that pressure but but back to this general manager he engages to do a design thinking program and to solve a difficult problem for his team and i really wasn't impressed and neither was his team when he gave us a condescending opening speech and then said enjoy your two days of training i'll be back at the end of the two days and we went, what? This is your executive team. We're trying to solve difficult problems. Who this was not training. Training implies giving you a skill. We're here to solve a difficult problem. Well, we need your input and we need your guidance and we need you to watch your team. Anyway, he left. The good news is people were, we discovered he was a control freak. So there's the control that shuts down creativity. So control was gone, at least for most of the two days. We had an amazing time. We, as you know, with design thinking, we, we came up with lots of ideation ideas, lots of prototypes. By the time he came back into the uh, into the room, the walls, by all four walls, were covered in flip charts, as was happens in a design thinking uh, ideation process. And each team was meant to present to him. So here we are at four o'clock in the afternoon. They're, they're coming back. To the, the first team was so excited. They, they were just bubbling with enthusiasm to present to the general manager their ideas. They got up and they charge and enthusiasm and he just sat in the middle of the room with his arms folded he was looking around at the room you could see he was freaked out by all the ideas because he wasn't there for the process he wasn't there for that part that where we said 99 percent of brainstorming ideas don't work but if you want the one percent you've got to go through the 99 percent to find that one percent anyway the first team was they sat down and he just sat there with this terrible body language you know talking about a real story here and he sat down with this terrible body language the second team got up to present they weren't quite so enthusiastic they're a little bit nervous because they could see that he wasn't he wasn't in tune with the rest of us by the time the fourth team got up to present, they were pushing each other saying, you do it, you do it, I don't want to do it. And this poor guy got pushed up to present in front of the general manager and he fumbled his way through the process and the GM just sat there with the most terrible body language. And that's when we realized you can have all the best tools in the world, all the best design thinking, all the best solutions of creative and critical thinking, but if you don't get the environment right, if you don't get everyone bought in on it, then the whole thing's a waste of time. That's exactly what I was talking about. Your story there, that's exactly what I was you know, articulating when I said that there's a mismatch between people saying they want creativity because that's it's right. the managers, the managers who have the, um, you know, the budget 
it's the managers whose neck is on the line if the risk is not fruitful, basically, you know, if, if it yeah. doesn't provide a return on investment. And if the managers are not creative, well, you know, you get a situation like you've just described. Well, we've actually now turned down programs where we get asked to do a design thinking intervention if the leadership team are not involved. So you, they start by ringing up saying they want a design thinking intervention for their team. And as we go through the process, they don't just want training. They want a solution. They want an outcome. They want to present it to the CEO. But if the CEO is not involved and doesn't understand the process and doesn't understand what's involved in this creative thinking, then the whole thing's going to fail because by the time they get to the CEO, they don't understand that we've tried to create a culture. I mean, one company said, well, the people that are going to be volunteered, meaning you're going to be pushed forward to do this course, are going to be expected to do it in their own time. So they're not even going to be given time off work. So I thought, great, we're going to get 20 people that have been told they must do this by their leader. But then they said, on the other hand, if they said they're going to volunteer to do it, the leader might say, oh, well, you're obviously not busy enough. We're going to give you more work if you've got time to go and do this. So as we said, it's really important before one embarks on any sort of innovative innovation intervention, and, and who doesn't have innovation in their mission statement at the moment? Don't get me started on that. But before they really get into that, they really have to set the right environment and get the get buy-in from everyone and get an understanding of what creative thinking is going to actually mean for the company and what the outputs are going to be. And we went, in, we went into one company, and it's, it's very typical, they showed us their innovation lab, which was on the top floor of a multi-million dollar uh, in development in Singapore. He took, the guy took, the innovation leader took us around and showed us everything, you know, the beanbag chairs, the free lunch, all the cool things that they've tried to transplant from Google. Uh, we gave the obligatory, wow, that's fantastic. And then he took me into a corner and said, it's not working. And I said, why? And he said, well, everyone still grabs the corner seat. No, there's no trust. There's no collaboration. People are not, there's no, there's no. And I said, well, what? You've spent all this money on the hardware. How much money have you spent on, on the development? And, and again, I don't like the word training, but on the, on the process of teaching people how to become creative, he said, nothing. And I said, well, there's your paradox. So I think, you know, that there's this race to create the innovation labs or have the hackathons where people are given free pizza and, and, and asked to stay up on a Friday night, which is meant to be apparently a cool thing to do. It doesn't work if we don't get the environment right and if we don't get people's brains and the neuroscience working to allow them to become creative. So we stopped selling two-day design thinking workshops and started saying, we want to spend a day doing a diagnostic, getting people prepared, looking at who killed creativity or what blocks creativity, helping them understand some strategies to become more creative. And then when we get into the actual design thinking processes, it just goes like that. And we've had people solve problems in three or four hours that they've said it's taken them years to solve because now they're ready and they're able to just it just it just becomes an open ability for them to be creative yeah you you've um, mentioned um um who killed creativity a couple of times and sir ken robinson he did that very famous ted talk didn't he do that's school, right do schools kill creativity and he also mentioned the research which um which says that the younger children they all raise their hands to say that they're creative whereas like the older they they got they were reluctant to say they were creative and and i suppose again it's to do with definition you know the, a young child you know um they don't know what um what the definition of creativity is so if you say to them are you creative they're they're going to say yeah yeah you, you know because there is no defining of it there are no parameters around it whereas the mm. older children you know they associate creativity with being artistic or with being musical or you know because that's what mm. they've been taught they've been taught maths and you know biology they're not the creative subjects the science subjects are not creative subjects and then you've got the arts so you know there's a gradual kind of it's a linguistic um, limitation as well, isn't it? You know, like well, that's another fallacy. I think that you're absolutely right. The when you talk to someone that hasn't really looked at this field much, and that you hear the word creativity, they immediately think artistic or musical. So it has been a little bit hijacked 
uh, by that. And that's perhaps why innovation as a buzzword has taken over from creativity. Maybe we, we better off to use the word creative thinking. But when we interview these children in the school, um, you know, we asked them, what is creative thinking? And they were rattling off design thinking terms that they'd never researched. Uh, you know, they, they were rattling off terms that, that professors at MIT and Stanford had spent 20 years just defining. And these six and seven year olds were just saying, well, you need to connect the dots. You need to, uh, you know, I mean, I won't use, they didn't use the word ideate or prototype, which are the new buzzwords that are buzzing around at the moment, but these kids were able to mimic the design thing. I remember I had my daughter come on one of my, she came on a work experience session when she was about 12 years old, just, just to keep her occupied. I know we were in, in, in another country and she watched me deliver a train the trainer session because we license our programs. And, and I was teaching, you know, some, some young upcoming trainers on how to be creative. And, and some of them were struggling with some of the concepts. And at 12 years old, she came to me at lunchtime and said, Dad, what is it they don't get? And, and you're absolutely right. It just for her, it was just so natural to talk about these ideas. But as these uh, young young adults become young adults, they they were so um, inhibited by the boundaries that had now been pushed on them that they uh, that they just they they struggled where she didn't struggle. She couldn't understand why they were struggling at some of the concepts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and. Um, the 16 year old that I was talking to you about, the one who said, I don't, you know, I just want you to tell me what to do. He wanted the correct answer. He just wanted a good mm. grade for that assignment. And I think, again, that's another reason it, you mentioned this earlier as well, that there is actually research. It was by Jackson, 1965, Jackson and somebody. It's, it's quite old research, but this research showed that when teachers were interviewed, like they did a very big kind of um, questionnaire or whatever, teachers preferred students who were who scored highly on the high intelligence scale rather than high creativity scale because the, you know, the IQ rather than creativity. And the reason for it, because um, those who, students who are highly creative don't usually agree with their teachers. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and who wants to be in a class where you've got people challenging you? I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time in Asia and, and, and obviously in Australia and, and spent a lot of time in classrooms in my earlier years because that was our background. And it was fascinating going from an Australian classroom where kids would challenge you and you'd just come out exhausted. But if it worked well, brilliant. And then you'd go into an Asian classroom where asking a question a teacher was asking a question to the teacher was a sign of disrespect because you were challenging their authority. I know Malcolm Gladwell talks about this in the Korean airline incident of the power ratio of authority. And so, you know, teaching in an Asian classroom is just a dream. You walk in, you say things, they all sit there and take notes. Um, and I, I challenge that way of learning because you, there are other ways to learn than to use a teacher's valuable resources with these back to you writing on a chalkboard. Um, but you're absolutely right. The creative kids will challenge you. And, and that's really the type of classroom that we should be doing now. Kids should be learning content online uh, through videos, through webinars. I've always said, if someone wants to engage me, I better be better than my free YouTube TED Talk, because, because I, that, that's a one way um, deliver of, delivery of the content. But, but if they want to pay for me, then I've got to do more than just deliver them content. I've got to be able to create an environment that gets a discussion going, gets people thinking, tailor it, come to outcomes. The same with kids in a classroom. If they want content, they should be able to, this is the concept of the flipped classroom. They want content that should be done at home. And when they get to the classroom, the, the teachers should be challenging, provoking, uh, setting up discussion groups. But that requires a lot more work. It requires the ability to facilitate and not just be the, the expert. And so you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it would be much more fun to teach in a classroom where the kids come in, sit down, listen and take notes while you spout off your knowledge. Yeah. But that's not going to allow for creativity. And I think Singapore is changing now. It, it, it was obviously the classic rote learning, you know, information in, information out, which is what Peter Freer talks about in his Pedagogy of the Oppressed book back in 19-whatever. Um, I think the Singapore is changing where they're starting to open a classroom of inquiry and discussion, which will really throw the whole model around. And it will be interesting to see one of the first Asian countries really trying to embrace this ability to, to flip the classroom over. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing about the creative children is that the those who are highly intelligent, they know exactly what the teacher wants and they will give them exactly what they want. Right. <laughs> Whereas the creative ones will go off and do their own thing. <laughs> and the thing exactly. is, it can be very difficult to 
assess uh, an assignment where the student has done not what you wanted them to do, but they've done their own thing. That requires more creativity on the part of the teacher. And, and, and as you said earlier, um, when I've done my research with creative teachers, those who are creative, they end up doing so much extra work in their own time. Because mm. and, and I hate to say it, but and so many I've got so many teacher friends that are just amazing and they're burnt out and they come and work for me now. <laughs> so I wish they were back in their classrooms. We um, developed an educational curriculum K-12 in India for 25 million children based on health. Uh, because it was just such a rote learning system of science and maths that um, one of the one of my lecturers at the university he'd said before he died and before he fully retired he wanted to go and do something valuable so it was really interesting to to try and bring, breathe an interactive experiential learning into a curriculum um, from K to 12 on the topic of health and teaching health in a way that again who are five Australians to tell the state of Tamil Nadu how to be healthy when when we say wash your hands and a principal says, well, I've got 2000 kids in my school and one broken tap. Uh, so you know, it's a, we, we had to work with them to really try and help them understand how to develop a curriculum that suited them. So I, I, I just think teachers are the most underpaid and overworked around. And, I, and I, wish, I wish we would not only flip the classroom, but flip the salary scale as well. And so our teachers were the most highly valued as, as we're seeing research coming out of the Nordic countries, particularly Finland. Um, where teachers are highly valued and therefore we are getting the best talent drawn into the teaching ability. Unfortunately, the, the only teachers that do survive are the passionate ones, but the burnout rate is horrific. And, and you're right, they, wanted, they will just resort to getting the numbers and getting the, getting, the, getting the figures in and getting the assignments marked because the creativity is being squeezed out of the teachers as well, right when we need it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I laugh, but it's not, it's a very serious subject, actually, isn't it that we, we just don't, you know, even though we we're so passionate about creativity, we don't always have the resources, you know, we don't, we just don't have the time, uh, um, you know, to be able to be creative in the way we teach, even though the willingness is there. That's, that's well, that's right. And what, what we did, as I said, over a period of years of um, both being teaching and then moving into corporate and then teaching creative thinking or design thinking, we started to gather everyone's excuses of all the reasons why they didn't think they were the creative ones. That's for another department, uh, as we know it should be for everyone. And, and that was the fun of writing the book. We, we gathered all the excuses and put them into categories and then sat down with a neuroscientist and psychologist and said, okay, what is going on uh, in, in these particular, what's going on with your brain? What's going on in the environment? And we boiled it down to seven killers or seven suspects or seven blockers. Uh, we wanted to keep a creative theme, heaven help us if we were to write a book on creativity and not be creative. Nothing worse than an educational lecturer giving you a lecture and not being educational. So we wanted to actually write a book with a creative theme. So that's why we called it the Who Killed Creativity and we gave it a crime scene investigation theme to, to again try and bring it alive and make it interesting and not just a dry academic text on, on creativity. And you know, when you talk about who killed creativity, the my immediate response to that, in a, in if you if you were to directly ask me that question, it would be, well, making schools compulsory, you know? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> whenever we make something compulsory, we, t we, we, you know, we, we squeeze out the creativity out of it. You, you and I, I'm sure like we must agree that if you say to somebody that you have to do this, um, th uh, there is new, newer research coming out that says that for highly creative people, if you make something compulsory, if you say they have to do something, they're, they're shown to be less creative than if it's well, like- Well, immediately, that, that's the control. So we've got the default part of the brain and, we, and there's also, I won't go into the, too much of the neuroscience, um, but you've got the default network and other networks, you've got the front and the back, left and right. Um, but the point is certain, certain environments pushed on you shut down certain parts of the brain so the default network gets shut down in this controlling environment if you're forced to do something but look I think you know the alternative is saying schools not schools voluntarily could have a dangerous results on the number of kids that, that think they can get off I think a better way to put it is if you think of it what, what makes a great teacher is when the bell went that kids wanted to finish what they were doing. Uh, what made a great, a bad teacher is, is kids in the classroom are doing nothing but looking at their watch, thinking, oh my gosh, five more minutes to go so I can get out of here. What, what we really should be measuring teachers by is, is, is their ability to engage 
um, and not the, the greatest mistake any teacher can make is to assume that the audience is as passionate about the topic as they are. And so really, if you're a maths teacher, you should be selling maths. If you're a science teacher, you need to be selling science, not just talking about it. Um, I had to do health and personal development and religious education when I first started, and they were three topics that were considered at the bottom of the marking scale. So I had no choice but to make my subjects interesting. And it got to the point where they became the most popular subjects in the school because I had to work really hard, and this is where the creativity came from, to keep kids in a delinquent boys' school engaged. It was, it was next to impossible, but, but we just had to work day and night, day and myself, to, to design material to make sure that they saw this topic as, as a relevant for their needs, not because there was an end of result assessment or an end of result exam or a box they had to tick. I wanted them to see the inherent value of what they were learning in that 53 minutes in the session, not some future thing. And I'm going to boast that when the bell did go off, kids wanted to stay. They enjoyed the session. Uh, I'm not saying I'd make a great maths teacher or science teacher, but that, that, that might be the solution because you're, you're black and white. Let's not make school voluntary. Let's, not, let's make school voluntary could, um, could un unearth a whole other uh, issue, couple of issues <laughs> around, around that. But maybe we can look at the concept behind and that is kids should be engaged. And that's the most important thing we should be doing in, in, in learning, making sure that our lessons have an engagement behind them rather than an end box to tick to say, I've now done it. And that should reflect through university and it should reflect through our own ongoing development as we become adults. We should be engaged and want to learn. The saddest thing about school is most kids finish year 12 and think, I never want to do it again. Wow, boy, have we achieved, not achieved our goals. What really should happen is by year 12, kids should say, my gosh, that was the most wonderful 12 years of my life. How can I continue the learning? Instead, we put them through the most grueling high school certificate set of exams that once they put their pen down, they never want to do it again. Well, in We've the really UK, missed the mark. In the UK, Andrew, 20% of school leavers, after they've done 12 years of school, 20% leave with no qualifications, basically. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope they got something out of it. But yeah, I mean, it, it just it is a it is a process. It's like Survivor TV show, isn't it? It's a process of elimination, and and you've got to ask yourself what what are we trying to achieve if we don't instill in, in those kids during that twelve years a love of ongoing learning? But instead, they put their pens down and think, oh my gosh. I never have to do this again. Some of us go on to uni because we want to tick the boxes and jump through the hoops in order to get a job. But we've lost the plot if we don't make the learning a, 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 an engaging, fun experience. And, and this comes back to the original part of our conversation. People went and did fun team building in the afternoon, but we used to sell to clients and say, hey, how about it's fun and they learn something? And the clients would go, really? Can you do both? And we'd say in the morning session, how about the morning session is they learn something, but it's also interactive. And they go, really? This is what 12 years of school have taught us, that fun and learning don't go together, but actually they should. And shame on us that we've, we've made fun and learning two separate things that, that are diametrically opposed in our, in our current brains. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much for all your stories, Andrew. I've really enjoyed listening to you. And you well, know, I'm sure we could continue to talk forever, but I uh, really appreciate it. And I hope people yeah. can um, can discover who killed creativity in their own personal life, and most importantly, how to get it back, which is the second half of the book. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. I'll speak with you soon. Bye bye. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.